Dzień dobry. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and also probably good evening, uh, because we are in a different part of the world. So uh, I would like to welcome you to Krakow. Uh, we are here. Uh, you can actually not see it, but some of us are actually here at the campus of uh, Andrzej Fritz Morzewski, Krakow University. Uh, uh, and uh, the majority of you uh, are online. Uh, and I guess uh, this is due to the circumstances we are dealing with uh, lately uh, because of the pandemic. We do regret that you are not here, but we hope that uh, soon this problem is over and then we can actually all meet here in Krakow. And I'll be waiting for you here. Uh, maybe not, uh, I will not stay here and wait for you uh, before you will come over, but I hope that it is possible uh, next year. Well, uh, we are supposed to talk about new technologies. Uh, so I guess uh, this our uh, remote meeting uh, is a little bit justified. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Uh, well, one click and uh, you are here from four continents uh, in Krakow and this is not happening uh, on a daily basis, believe me. So I would like to welcome all of you uh, and uh, thank you for uh, directing your attention uh, to the event which we are organizing together uh, with uh, Portuguese Brazilian international professor uh, Fabio da Silva Vega Hi, Fabio. Fabio is online with us. Uh, and uh, dear colleague uh, of mine, Professor Piotr Stets uh, from the University of Opole in Poland. I hope Piotr is uh, also with us uh, remotely. Uh, it is thanks to you that uh, today and tomorrow lawyers from four continents uh, will be discussing the future of our work, uh, technological tools, uh, and what the lawyers of tomorrow will be like. Uh, we will see uh, this future, and I hope uh, it will be interesting for all of you. Well, as you probably know, uh, our event has been widely echoed in Poland, uh, and I hope actually it is the same in your countries. Uh, today, we do have uh, with us uh, representatives of uh, the most important centers of uh, science, and also of legal practice with us. I'm very happy and I'm very proud of it. Uh, as you know, uh, we also have uh, representatives from abroad, uh, actually the largest group of uh, conference participants today is from abroad. And among others, uh, we, have, we have with us, of course, 
Professor Fabio da Silva Vega. And I would like to ask Fabio for a few words, uh, especially uh, to the members of the Iberojur, uh, the organization uh, of uh, uh, which Fabio is the president. So Fabio, floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Marius. Um, I, I would like to greet the colleagues at AFM Creco University and greet the members of this offshore opening act. I greet the Professor Marius Dalucci and on his behalf, I would like to thank AFM Creco University for welcoming the Ibero-American legal community in Poland. I greeted all the participants, researchers, professors, and students. As president of the Ibero-American Institute of Legal Studies, Iberojur, I remark my satisfaction in promoting academic integration activities and realizing that the results of high-level academic research are demonstrated in prestigious events such as the first Juristec. First Juristec has de demonstrated a great capability for international cooperation between Polish, Brazilian, Portuguese, Spanish, and other colleagues from many countries. Therefore, it will provide a lively debate of ideas around relevant topics on law and new technologies. By means of this, in addition to academic integration, the event will provide the opportunity for new views of ideas on legal problems experienced in almost every country in the world. In this spirit of collaboration, I want to congratulate all the authors and wish everyone an excellent conference. Thank you, Professor Marius, please. Thank you, Fabio, for a uh, warm opening uh, of uh, our meeting. And uh, I do regret that you are not here in Krakow, uh, or maybe that I am not uh, uh, at Porto, I believe. Uh, um, dear friends, uh, um, uh, I would like to uh, thank to the authorities of uh, my university, the Andrzej Fritz Mozewski Krakow Academy. As you can see, Andrzej is here with me. Uh, well, he has died a long time ago, but you, all of you know uh, his uh, story. Uh, but uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, two persons uh, without uh, whom this project wouldn't be possible. Uh, and one of them is uh, Professor Jerzy Malec, uh, vice rector of uh, our academy. And unfortunately, he could not be with us today, but he has uh, recorded a video. And now a dear colleague of mine, uh, Agnieszka uh, kubek vice dean of our faculty, will try to share this video with you. He will speak in Polish, so some of you can listen how beautiful this language is. Szanowni Państwo, jest mi niezmiernie miło przywitać uczestników dzisiejszej konferencji. Żyjemy w czasach, kiedy rozwój technologii, nowych technologii następuje tak szybko, że prawo często nie nadąża za tworzeniem odpowiednich regulacji, które by były dostosowane do tych zmian, które następują. I właśnie Temu zagadnieniu, czyli wpływowi nowych technologii na regulacje prawne poświęcone będzie dzisiejsze spotkanie i jutrzejsze, bo konferencja jest dwudniowa. Współorganizatorami konferencji są obok Krakowskiej Akademii im. Andrzeja także Instytuto Iberoamericano Los Juridicos. Tematem konferencji jest Legal Tech, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Legal Practice. 
czyli dyskusja o przyszłości prawnika w świecie nowych technologii. W świecie, który rozwija się w tempie no, niesłychanie szybkim i wymusza nowe regulacje prawne. A uczestnicy pochodzić będą z czterech kontynentów. Partycypanty z Stanów Zjednoczonych, Brazylii, Ekwadoru, Stąd Argentyny, Uruguayu i wielu państw europejskich. Tu Brazyl, Te wnioski, które Azji, państwo i tam będą kontynenty europejskie. Jestem przekonany, że przeniosą się na praktykę prawną, aż no z z wiele problemów, które przed nami stoją. Wą, e, wielu na nasza praktyka. doznań intelektualnych. Tezerzu, a tu do złóż kolegasz. Ciągnięcia e, interesujących refleksji. E, do a nas, także do nas życzę, kontru, aby kolejne spotkania, a pewnie takie również będą może kontruż, w zakresie tematu, o którym dzisiaj będzie e, aby można było spotkać także już to samo, że tam by, no, nie no, nie no, po to, Wszystkiego A najlepszego widzę. Państwu życzę. Dziękuję. To do dywej. Obrigado. Ok, uh, I asked him for a short speech that was short according to our rector. Uh, well, and I would like to thank for this uh, warm uh, words also from him because uh, he is one of the persons with, without whom, as I told you before this, event would not be organized. Uh, and there is uh, one more uh, person who will uh, speak to you. He also has recorded a video. This time it will be in English. This is uh, our dean and the person without whom nothing is possible in this building and uh, with whom we do appreciate uh, our cooperation. That is Professor Jan Widacki, uh, a great uh, Polish lawyer, uh, very famous place, person in this country, and we are really happy that we can cooperate with him. Take a look at, look at him with, and please listen to a short speech from him in English. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to participants of our conference. Okay, good afternoon for participants from Central Europe. But as we have participants from all around the world, it is good morning to the participants from America and good evening. No, wherever you are, let me Welcome, everyone. My name is Jan Widacki, and I'm a dean of the School of Law, Administration and International Relations Hello. at the Andrzej Fritz Modrzewski Kraków University, the main organizer of our conference. I know that the name of our university is very hard to pronounce for foreigners. I'm very sorry for that. A very famous American psychologist, Harold Bart, said that law is always conservative. It is always one step behind life. I think he was wrong. Our conference and the subject of our conference proved him wrong. Artificial intelligence is a new problem, a new problem in, even for law. So I'm very glad that a conference devoted to problems of artificial intelligence and law is organized by young lawyers, scientists and academics, of our university. I hope you will have a good time, a good discussion, and I'm absolutely sure it will be a good conference. As soon as pandemic is over, I invite you to Krakow 
a historical town, royal capital of Poland, a town of science and culture, a town of plentiful heritage and history, and home of the oldest Polish university, Jagiellonian University, founded in 14th century. Kraków is real capital of Polish culture and Polish science. I wish, I wish you a good and fruitful at all time and see you in Kraków, maybe in the near future. Thank you. Okay, that was another uh, short speech uh, from a Polish uh, professor, but I hope this is the end of talking heads except mine. Uh, well, I must also say that uh, the conference is supported by several institutions. It's not only the cooperation of Andrzej Fritz-Morzewski, Krakow University and uh, Ibero Jur, but also we are supported by the city of Krakow. You could have seen uh, uh, the movie before we have started, how beautiful this city is. Uh, we are also supported by the National Bar Council with its president. And our, unfortunately, he couldn't be with us also because uh, uh, now, uh, during this time, uh, the meeting of the board of uh, National Bar Council is running. Um, Advocate uh, Przemysław Rosati greets uh, uh, all of us. And I I am fortunate that I will not have to present another movie uh, today. Uh, also, uh, local uh, uh, bar council in Krakow, local bar council in Rzeszów, uh, local uh, legal advisors council from Krakow and local legal advisors council from Rzeszów uh, are with us. Uh, thank you for your support. This is uh, something that is very important to me. Uh, and uh, because uh, I can speak right now freely, uh, I would like to welcome not only academics, but also legal practitioners, including uh, my colleagues uh, from Rzeszów, which are here with us. Rzeszów uh, uh, Bar Association is uh, this association uh, where I practice uh, as an advocate. So I'm really happy that some of us uh, uh, are here today. Uh, as the organizer, I would also uh, like to say uh, that uh, the proceedings will take place uh, in plenary sessions and uh, in thematic panels. It's probably you could have seen in the conference program. Uh, we will have three online rooms. Room A will be the one where the plenary session will start just after I will finish uh, talking. I think it will happen soon. Uh, and uh, there's important information for all of you who do not speak Portuguese or Spanish. Uh, we will have a simultaneous translation. Uh, you just have to click on an appropriate icon. Uh, I think uh, it has something to do with translations or interpretation, or there should be a flag of uh, one of those beautiful countries that uh, you can find on your screen. So once again, uh, thank you all for your presence, even if it's only an online presence. I wish all of you a present and interesting uh, deliberations. And after the conference, I encourage you to contribute to join our uh, publication. And I hope that uh, uh, Fabio will be the one who will run this publication uh, very uh, fast. So now we are about to start a panel uh, plenary session of uh, our conference. Uh, we are three minutes late, uh, so it's not that bad, as you know. Uh, we will have three speakers, uh, two from Poland and one from Brazil. We will start with a, a famous uh, Brazilian professor from Unisonos University. Uh, Wilson Engelman, I hope uh, Professor Engelman is with us remotely, and he will speak about uh, artificial intelligence regulations 
uh, by principles and the contributions of the living uh, lab regulations. Uh, uh, dear Professor, the floor is yours. After Professor Engelmann, we'll have two more speakers and then I hope to start a discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, please, Professor Engel Engelmann, 20 minutes, maybe a little bit more. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon here in Brazil is good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I will did my presentation in Portuguese and I will start now. Uh, I am professor from a, a Jesuit university that is located in the southernmost state from Brazil, Rio Grande do Sul. And uh, we have the main campus in São Leopoldo and a second campus in Porto Alegre, that is the capital of the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, every, uh, from now on, I will speak in Portuguese. Excuse me. Bom, bom dia a todos, então, muito obrigado pela então, oportunidade de Barbara estar Jean aqui. Uh, muito obrigado uh, ao professor Dr. Fábio Veiga pelo convite e pela bardzo, amabilidade das bardzo, relações bardzo, acadêmicas bardzo, que bardzo, temos bardzo, desenvolvido. Bardzo. Uh, a minha pesquisa, uh, que eu Moi trago badana. aqui alguns resultados provisórios e Na preliminares é, versos sobre a regulação da inteligência artificial. Né? E a proposta que eu quero trazer aqui é justamente sobre a figura, e não é uma figura é, do direito propriamente dita, mas é uma figura importada da área da gestão em negócios, especificamente da área da administração, e se chama de Living Lab. Living Lab. Living Lab. Então, isso é, é, é um nome, não é? é uma denominação Living Lab foi utilizada pela primeira vez em 1990, na década de 1990, a fim de descrever a experimentação dos alunos para resolver problemas em um bairro da Filadélfia, nos Estados Unidos. Essa é uma, uma perspectiva interessante, porque na Europa também a adoção de ambiente de vida real e a experimentação real surgiu por volta de 2005. E resultados da revisão da literatura indicam que o termo Living Lab também é considerado um fenômeno multidisciplinar, por isso a importância de nós trazermos para o contexto desse seminário, amplamente utilizado em diferentes contextos e abrange vários domínios de pesquisa, apesar de ser tipicamente discutido sob paradigmas da inovação aberta, open innovation, e centrada no usuário. A literatura que eu revisei para essa apresentação Literatura, que eu é, ela evidencia o desenvolvimento de software Ona e o uso de, software, de ferramentas digitais e até então identificava digitali. duas categorias de Living Lab. A primeira, a, a qual o Living Lab, ou os Living Labs, são infraestruturas para a inovação aberta e centrada no usuário, onde há o suporte de uma rede de partes interessadas a criação e desenvolvimento de produtos e serviços com o envolvimento ativo de usuários finais. Uma segunda linha identificada na revisão da literatura ela apresenta os Living Labs como ambientes de ensaio para a introdução de novas aplicações por meio de sua exposição e validação pelos usuários finais. Assim, os Living Labs inicialmente eram vistos como um tipo de sala 
espaço ou lá. cidade conectada com uma metodologia centrada no usuário, onde so, pesquisadores uh, na, na uh, e usuários finais percebem, inovam, validam e refinam tecnologias uh, complexas em um contexto da vida da real. Esse conceito uh, é, recebeu o interesse de muitas disciplinas, e a ideia ono, ono dos Living Labs foi se expandindo com o passar do tempo. E Existe e hoje uma ampla variedade de atividades que é realizada sob o termo Living Labs, tendo sido descritos como metodologia, como rede, como sistema, como conceito, como abordagem, como ambiente ou ecossistema, seguindo diferentes abordagens e contextos, né, conforme eu pude perceber na revisão da literatura. Então, nesse contexto, não é, se percebe facilmente que é um processo de cocriação Y, polega na, en todas las fases de un proceso de procesu, y comercialización. Y comercialización. La perspectiva que yo traigo aquí es intentar traer ese concepto que aún no es utilizado en la área del derecho para que se pueda pensar en un living lab regulatorio. Y la propuesta do tema aqui desenhado, é que a gente possa construir um modelo a partir de um conjunto de princípios já publicados para a utilização segura da inteligência artificial, incluindo os robôs em geral e os robôs humanoides, que já existe, por exemplo, e aqui eu trago um, um belo exemplo, que existe no Japão, onde eu encontrei é, uma zona especial e experimental chamada de Toco Special Zone for Robotics Empirical Testing and Development. Este laboratório, ou esta zona especial, esse Living Lab, ele iniciou o desenvolvimento e a implantação desde 2003 na cidade de Fukuoka e Kita e ela foi inicialmente criada para testar a tecnologia dos robôs estruturada em laboratório vivo onde vem recebendo mais recentemente também espaços para testar eh, estruturas normativas Estrutura aplicadas normativa. à inteligência artificial e aos robôs, especialmente eh, em relação aos robôs humanoides. A pesquisa que eu, eu estou aqui parcialmente relatando, ela está em desenvolvimento na universidade, na Unicinos, da onde eu sou professor e pesquisador, e nós estamos desenvolvendo um Living Lab regulatório e com o apoio lab, de sete startups da área da inteligência artificial e que estão incubadas dentro da incubadora do polo tecnológico da Unicinos, a Universidade do Vale do Rio dos Sinos. Universidade Brasileira Rio dos Sinos, prowadzi do tego badania. E o que nós percebemos? É, então a primeira etapa foi fazer justamente uma aproximação com essas empresas para tentar verificar quais são as necessidades regulatórias que essas empresas percebem ao longo do seu eh, trabalho diário com a inteligência artificial. 
na podstawie całej pracy z, ze sztuczną inteligencją. I się percebeł, że jest e, un grande espaço para a área do direito. Primeiro, dada a ausência de uma regulação formal, de uma lei acerca da nanotecnologia, acerca da inteligência artificial, desculpa. Então, a partir dessa necessidade externada pelos eh, pelas empresas, pelos pelas startups, então agora nós estamos eh, na segunda etapa desse projeto de pesquisa, onde nós estamos então desenhando eh, um framework eh, que possa então servir de guia para que essas startups eh, possam desenvolver de uma maneira mais segura, dentro de um contexto jurídico, o desenvolvimento da inteligência artificial. Para a estruturação desse, desse framework, eh, eu venho trabalhando com alguns princípios e com alguns autores, e um dos autores que eu tenho trabalhado com bastante intensidade é o jus filósofo é, chamado Luciano Floridi, que é italiano, mas é, ele atualmente está na Universidade de Oxford. E Luciano Floridi, justamente, ele apresenta uma série de princípios, não é? É estabelecendo aquilo que ele chama de um mapa da ética dos algoritmos. E é muito interessante, porque ele estrutura eh, esse framework a partir de princípios tradicionais da bioética, como a beneficência, a não maleficência, a autonomia e a justiça. E o professor Luciano Floridi, nesse framework, que então nós estamos trabalhando, estamos ampliando, acrescenta ainda a explicabilidade como um direito, é, como um princípio, aliás, fundamental dentro desse contexto ainda não regulado da inteligência artificial. Em uma pesquisa, eu pude observar que, por exemplo, nós temos é, 84 é, normas diferentes elaboradas pelos mais variados países do globo, não é? com documentos eh, tentando estabelecer eh, ethical guidelines for artificial intelligence. E esses ethical guidelines, eles podem ser encontrados em países do Ocidente, países do Oriente, países do Norte, países do Sul, países eh, da Europa, países eh, da América, América Latina, eh, Estados Unidos, vários países eh, do, do Oriente. E esses 84 documentos que eu pude levantar, eles têm alguns princípios em comum. Então, é muito interessante isto, porque talvez seja o um momento eh, de nós tentarmos eh, estabelecer é, estruturas regulatórias a partir de princípios. Talvez seja o momento de nós voltarmos e estudarmos novamente a teoria que sustenta o desenvolvimento dos princípios, que ganhou muita importância, não é? É, especialmente a partir das constituições é, democráticas não é? que estão sendo desenvolvidas, foram desenvolvidas especialmente durante a segunda metade do século XX, e, e justamente a partir daí, a perspectiva dos princípios, ela entra para dentro da estrutura da norma jurídica como uma espécie de norma jurídica ao lado das regras. E o que é mais emocionante nessa pesquisa é que existem alguns princípios que conectam todos esses países. Então, isso é um, é um achado é, que, para mim, como pesquisador, é, eu recebo isso com muito entusiasmo, porque parece que, pela primeira vez, nós temos condições de conectar países, 
e culturas diferentes, de países diferentes, com é, perspectivas econômicas, sociais, políticas muito distintas, mas que estão assentadas a partir de princípios que são comuns. Por exemplo, o princípio da transparência é encontrado em 73 dos 84 documentos pesquisados. A preocupação com a justiça e com a equidade é encontrada, são princípios encontrados em 68 documentos dos 84 que eu encontrei na pesquisa. A não maleficência, veja que é um princípio genuinamente da bioética, é encontrado em 60 dos 84 documentos. A responsabilidade, que é um outro princípio muito importante, é, é também encontrado em 60 dos 84 documentos pesquisados. E um outro, para finalizar, o princípio da privacidade, a preocupação com a privacidade, é encontrado em 47 dos 84 documentos. Depois aparece ainda a beneficência, a liberdade, a autonomia, a, a confiança, a sustentabilidade, a dignidade e a solidariedade. Então, a gente percebe aqui um conjunto de princípios que podem unir os direitos dos mais variados países, independentemente da, 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 do respeito aos elementos multiculturais, e justamente por aí, então, a perspectiva do segundo passo do Living Lab é nós construirmos, então, um framework a partir desses princípios que aparecem em maior número nessa pesquisa e aí tentar fazer a conexão para mostrar para essas empresas, para essas startups, que é possível fazer uma governança a partir de princípios, localizando esses princípios no direito interno do Brasil, por exemplo. E esse é um exercício que poderá ser feito em qualquer país, porque como os princípios são um tronco comum, o pesquisador de Portugal, da Polônia, da Espanha, do México, da, do Japão, de qualquer lugar, dos Estados Unidos e outros, podem tomar esses princípios e fazer as conexões com o seu direito interno e, portanto, nós teremos, então, um direito global, por meio desse elemento dos princípios, que faz a conexão com o direito interno e, dentro do direito interno, com a previsão normativa que já existe sobre esses princípios. Então, essa é uma questão muito interessante. Né? Então, essa é, efetivamente, a ideia e a perspectiva do, do Living Lab regulatório é que você possa, então, é, desenvolver este framework a partir desses princípios, oferecê-lo para essas empresas. Essas empresas vão passar a operar o seu dia a dia, por isso um laboratório real, observando esses princípios. E nós, do direito, como verdadeiros cientistas, saindo agora do seu laboratório e indo para o mundo real, aonde a vida acontece, nós teremos condições de observar, de anotar e verificar se a proposta do framework principiológico está adequado né? ou está uh, fora da possibilidade e também mostrando aonde nós podemos, então, efetivamente contribuir. Então, em grandes linhas... Eu não quero aqui é, é, ultrapassar também é, muito o meu tempo, que eu acho que eu já esgotei ele. Eu agradeço a oportunidade é, de estar aqui né? e me coloco à disposição para responder perguntas e para o diálogo é, ao fim dessa sessão plenária. Thank you, professor. Uh, uh, I have uh, finished my speak and I return to you the the opportunity to, to uh, give the continuity of this panel. Okay. Thank you, Professor Engelmann, for your brilliant and very interesting speech. 
uh, in the language that I did not understand at all. Uh, <laughs> But fortunately, uh, we have resolved the problems with the translation. Okay. And now it works. I will say a few words in Polish to the Polish uh, speaking uh, participants. Drodzy Państwo, mieliśmy pewne problemy z tłumaczeniami simultanicznymi, ale teraz już wszystko powinno funkcjonować tak, jak należy. Ja pisałem o tym na czacie, ale powiem jeszcze raz o tym. Wystarczy teraz kliknąć ikonkę języka angielskiego, pod tym kryje się tłumaczenie na język polski. Oczywiście teraz nie będzie tłumaczenia, bo to tłumaczenie dotyczy tylko hiszpańskiego i portugalskiego. Wyszliśmy z założenia, że językiem Szekspira większość z nas przemawia. OK, uh, I had to explain some uh, problems uh, with uh, the translation, but finally I think we have get rid of it. And now we can listen to another speaker. And fortunately, this speaker is with us today. Uh, is a uh, very famous Polish professor Wojciech Cyril uh, from the Jagiellonian University, uh, a specialist in uh, legal tech and uh, anything that is connected with it. Uh, and uh, he will uh, present uh, a speech uh, on the computer-aided or machine-consumable legislation, and that is a question. Mm -hmm. Professor Cyril. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Zawodzki, for invitation and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I would like to say at the beginning that I am very honored that pleased to, to be able to address uh, the problem of uh, IT and legislation to such an esteemed audience. And uh, well, I, my presentation will be, uh, will be divided into several parts, but I would like to, after uh, introductory remarks, uh, inform you about the current development or historical development of, and the, the technical standards implemented in the legislation. I will try to discuss the problem uh, whether the machine, so-called machine consumable legislation is, a, uh, is our future or not. Uh, and later on, I will share some uh, conclusions and uh, some observations about it. Uh, let me start by, by saying that the new possibilities offered by technological innovation in legislative uh, practice have not only mm, given uh, rise to phenomenon of e-legislation, but also laid down foundation for a new technological paradigm of law. You may be uh, heard about so-called uh, law as code idea or code as law, sometimes it's exchangeable. Uh, in the same time, uh, the widespread use of IT tools in lawmaking process also means that more and more initiatives are being launched that highlight the new potential of the electronic format of legal texts. Examples include the automated consolidation of text of legal acts, the automated uh, translation of regulations, automated automation legal information retrieval and automation legal references and many, many more. Thus, uh, the primary problem we are facing uh, uh, now is the consequences of the implementation of the new information uh, technologies. Uh, respectively, in my presentation, I will discuss the role that IT plays in the contemporary process involving the drafting of legal texts in electronic format, the technical conditions regula uh, regulating the computerization and algorithm uh, algorithmization of legal texts, as well as their online publication. Later, it is on this basis uh, that the concept of machine consumable legislation will be presented and uh, discussed. Uh, 
in conclusion, it will be stated that incorporation of legal rules uh, into the architecture of electronic systems with the aim of automating the activities described in the regulation is not an entirely new idea. Furthermore, contrary to computer added legislation, due to some inherent uh, limitation, there is little reason to believe that machine consumer legislation uh, become a dominant paradigm of legal drafting in the near future. And to catch your attention, uh, I will just say that I hope that the thesis is right, because if I am wrong, uh, there will be also no much space left for lawyers in the near future. Uh, let me now say a couple of words about the uh, history and the development of the computer added legislation. Uh, please note, however, that the first attempts to use computer systems in legal domain uh, date back only to the mid 20th century. Moreover, the use of information technology was initially limited to the task of remedying the legislative crisis caused by the steady increasing number of legal texts. Since both an efficient state administration and economic growth depend on fast, cheap, easy, and safe access to applicable laws, it is not surprising that despite initial teething problems, private and public systems of legal information such as Light, Juris, Credoc, Italia Gurefine, Seni, or Cran began to emerge in various countries from the end of 1960s onwards. Uh, the first stage of the development of computer added legislation was connected with the problem of digitalization of legal text. Uh, please remember uh, that to make printed legal text available in electronic legal information systems, uh, they first had to be transformed into digital format or machine readable form. Initially, the OCR, optical character recognition technology, was used for this purpose. However, with the popularization of personal computers and the development of various computer applications, including word processors, legal texts from the beginning were prepared in the electronic format. Uh, the role of information technology in legal domain was further enhanced with the advent of the internet for general use. It's actually 1995. Thanks to the development of general availability of WWW architecture, users of computers operating graphic modes like X uh, Windows, Apple Macintosh, or MS Windows uh, gained simple access to all published web resources. What is more, thanks to the launch of search engines, they also acquired the ability to search web resources effectively without the need of advanced IT knowledge. This way, space was created for the development of public and commercial legal information services. However, it is important to bear in mind that even in 1990s and at the beginning of 21st century, the legal text were usually published in HTML as files in PDF format or in other format that only allowed them to be downloaded or viewed on the web. Only later were the legal texts in form specially designed for the legal documents, enabling not only advanced searches for and searches in such text, but also the automation of their management and amendment. Uh, the computer added legislation has required the implementation of new solutions to ensure data security, uh, both in terms of safeguarding the in integrity of already published legal texts, as well as draft legal acts. Technical solutions are also largely entrusted with the task of ensuring the authenticity and accessibility of legal texts on the web. In particular, they are responsible for guaranteeing their integrity and both on the database level and uh, in their presentation and both in uh, during legislative uh, stage and when laws are published online. Uh, 
from the perspective of the legislative process, WWW architecture has contributed to a paradigm shift in the way legal texts are published and accessed or interpreted on a level similar to changes caused earlier by print. The use of internet in legal domain has resulted not only in the proliferation and diversification of our sources of knowledge of law on an unprecedented scale, but it has evolved uh, and evaluated the role of private and public legal information systems. Moreover, a number of tools have also been specially devised to support the work of legislators and facilitate the publication of legal text on the internet. Beside the above mentioned editors uh, of legal acts, such as Polish EDAP or EAP legislator or Italian XM Legas, Dutch Metavex or American uh, Legis Pro, complex e-legislation system have also been developed. One model example of such, of such a system is uh, uh, E-Recht, which was developed in <coughs> Austria. Another example of the aid offered by IT in legislative processes are public online consultation systems. Such solutions have been successfully launched, for example, in Greece, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Portugal, and Hungary. This shows that IT not only helps enhance the rationality and effectiveness of legal regulations, but also enables the creation of platforms promoting political debate and public consultation when issuing op uh, opinions on draft legal arts. Uh, despite the widespread use of IT in both the creation and application of the law, there is still insufficient knowledge among users with regard to how much the development, accessing and retrieval of reliable, uh, relevant legal information depends on the application of specific standards for encoding and decoding information in a way that enables such information to be processed by machines. Failure to apply such standards may not only prevent access to information, but also affects its authenticity and integrity. Technical standards determine, among other things, the capability and methods of combining different information as well as the way used to describe the structure, content, and displaying of individual documents. This is why it is so important that the standards used to create and access legal information are not only of high quality, but also are open in the broad sense of the term. This means, among other things, that they should be publicly accessible and understandable. Uh, as well as ensure the development and adaptation of such information for future needs. Moreover, obviously, they should not be restricted by intellectual property rights. The establishment of uniform technical standards has resulted in the progressive standardization of the formats used for electronic documents containing legal information. This, in turn, has enabled in practice the automation of certain activities in the legislative process. Uh, in example, automatic standardization of the text of legal acts. Text, thanks to these developments, it has also been possible to implement projects in the field of law based on the, uh, the idea of the semantic web. The development of legislative systems based on the semantic web has been paralleled by attempts to promote the idea that legal information made available on the web should be processed not only at the level of individual characters in a text, but also after taking into account the structure of legal text and the concepts and methods and the concepts therein. Uh, in other words, the purpose of the semantic web is to enable machines to process information contained in the text of a legal act, not only at the structural level, but also semantically, while of course maintaining determinism of actions. Moreover, this concept is based on the assumption that any device or tool should be able to access the network 
and more importantly, that the quality of the solution used should be uh, should inspire user trust. This means that this solution should be safe and predictable in operation and should protect the privacy uh, of individuals who use them. Such an effect is possible thanks to the development and implementation of appropriate technological standards. Some of these already exist, while others are still in the preparatory or introductory stage. Uh, the standards are presented in the uh, slide, which is now on your computer screens. Um, the idea of machine consumable legislation, I will later uh, refer to as MCL, was proposed by Matthew Weddington. And this idea is closely connected with the issue of using IT to increase legal certainty and effectiveness. Simply put, it comes down to the task of incorporating legal rules into digital reality. As a consequence, this strategy involves creating action space for individuals in such a way as to prevent behaviors inconsistent with certain rules or with law. For obvious reason, a similar approach is now quite common in business processes where both the number, type, time, and effects of activities performed by individuals can be strictly determined, controlled, and supervised by a functioning information system. We can do risk arguing that this approach is essentially based on the creative combination and transfer to the public sphere of two relatively well-known technical solutions, i.e. systems with progressive rules and markup languages that allow machines to recognize the structure and content of electronic document. In the case of MCL, we are dealing not so much with new technology as with a new approach to creating and accessing law. It assumes the parallel preparation of draft text of legal acts in, of course, natural language and software, which will operate in accordance with the provision contained within them, which will be written, of course, in computer languages. This approach, this postulates exploiting the enormous potential of publishing and accessing legislation in electronic format, especially given the fact that nowadays legal acts are not only prepared with the use of the text editors and saved in formats that allow them to be accessed online, but also as they are available in machine readable forms. In contrast to the semantic network, the MCL concept it not, is not limited to the task of drafting legal text in a machine readable way, but also involves state authorities creating and sharing legally functioning software. The main purpose of such a solution is neither to ensure, uh, to enable users to find relevant legal information more easily, nor to automate the process of standardization the text of legal acts, but rather to provide addresses of the law with software that will legally determine the consequences arising from specific circumstances, circumstances specified in the law. Please note, however, that in this way, the traditional roles of legal text, such as informing and regulating human behavior, are changed in to steering and controlling. Despite appearances, the idea itself is not that revolutionary. In practice, public authorities currently use software for their internal needs, automating certain processes in accordance with legal requirements. Programs of this type are used nowadays, for example, to calculate uh, tax liabilities or pension rights. The novelty of the approach uh, uh, is 
the obligation of uh, creation coded version of the law by the state authorities or at their request in parallel with the drafting of the text of a new legal act and make it public, uh, publicly available for all interested uh, users or all interested entities and not only for state officers or uh, state departments. There is no doubt that this approach has many advantages. Certainly, creating and ensuring access to a coded version of a legal act, along with the text of legal uh, act, will reduce the risk of errors that may arise in its absence. When becoming into force for a new law, will require computer program developers to adopt to its requirements. Moreover, the availability of such a version would also make it possible to effectively test various alternatives or solutions considered during the legislative process and to automatically check the consistency and correctness or complexness of legal texts. However, it remains an open question as to how and with what tools the coding process itself should function. Another important issue is to determine both the legal consequences of using such tools and their legal status. What will happen if the software will not correspond with the written text? Other advocates of this approach also see in it an opportunity to introduce more digitally friendly legislation, it should not be forgotten that the broader application of this concept may require adapting the language of law to the needs of computer systems. Summing up, the above reflection leads me to the conclusion that given the political conditions shaping legislative processes, the expenditure incurred in creating coded versions of law and specific status of legal text, there is a little reason to believe that the above discussed approach will become popular in the near future. In the same time, nowadays it is difficult to imagine a modern legislative process without the existence of specially designed text editors for legal acts, converters, name resolvers, validators, e-legislator, e-legislation platforms, electronic consultation systems, and many, many other tools facilitating the general management and the publication of electronic documents. Let's hope, as, and let's hope as lawyers, that we'll never try to replace legislators and lawyers with uh, machines and will not try even to uh, make all law machine consumer. That would be it for today. Thank you for listening to me. I hope it was of interest to you. And uh, if you uh, are interested in the topic, please uh, go on Legal Engineering um, EU. This is the website on, about legal tech. And I also would like to inform you that soon there will be a uh, uh, English version of Polish book, Legal Tech, where this topic is further elaborated. Thank you very much, and I in invite you for discussion. Thank you, Professor Cyril. It was really nice to uh, listen to you. And this presentation was uh, really interesting. I already have plenty of questions. I hope there will be time that you will, or you will find the time to answer it. Uh, I wanted to show you uh, how uh, it uh, looks uh, like around here, but it's not possible since uh, we are using a professional camera, but I will think and maybe figure out something out later. And now uh, we're up to the third presentation of this plenary session. 
And uh, this will be strange uh, because, uh, um, well, maybe not that strange as uh, I may think of, but Professor Julia Stanek, she is from uh, uh, the Faculty of Law of Andrzej Frisch-Morzewski, but she is not here due to some health uh, uh, problems of her daughter, as uh, I uh, understood it correctly. She has recorded a video, but she is with us remotely. So first, uh, we will uh, listen to her presentation recorded on a video, and then she will be happy to answer the questions uh, if uh, there are any. Uh, I just have noticed that uh, a colleague of mine uh, is uh, has joined us uh, and the head of the uh, Bar Council from Rzeszów, Advocate Marcin Cichulski. Cześć Marcin, cieszę się, że jesteś z nami. Uh, and now we can uh, start the presentation of uh, Professor Julia Stanek. I hope Julia is with us. I have seen her before, so uh, it is possible. But now we will uh, uh, show the video. It's about 20 minutes. Good morning, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for that great event and the possibility to be here. I would like to present some ideas on normative system based on trustworthiness. In the world we live in today, we are almost constantly being evaluated, not only by the environment we live in, but also by various institutions. We create rankings when we evaluate others, a Uber driver, a house rented for summer. We use rankings when choosing a university for our child, a doctor, a book to read, or even where to go for a lunch. And we are ranked to it for the purpose of an evaluation of our university. This common and widespread evaluation undoubtedly influence the choice we make, our legal situation, or speaking more generally, our lives. The next and quite obvious step after this is the creation of a system that would combine all available information and based on this information various organizations and companies would be evaluated. This evaluation would apply also for citizens. Perhaps uh, this reminds some of you of the dystopian world depicted in Black Mirror episode Nose Dive. A vision of the future where every citizen has a rating from 0 to 5, which derives from the subjective assessments made by everyone around, and this rating determines their social status, including where they are allowed to use public services. But if such system was developed and controlled by state public authorities, it would provide them with unimaginable tools to control, to enforce the law, to punish, but also to reward citizens, just like in the Orwellian scenario of society. But it's a system we have seen not only in the artistic visions, we can see a steadily growing number of similarities between that system and the one that is currently being tested in China. The project was titled Social Credit System, a system based on new technologies, combines huge public and private data collections with financial and social evaluations of actions of individuals and organizations. Its purpose is to alter, to modify, and to reinforce the desired behavior of citizens and organizations, and finally to form a high-trust society, which rewards individuals and companies for following the law. Before I discuss the outline of the system, I think it's worth mentioning that the English term social credit is far from perfect translation of the Chinese phrase I'll not even try to read that. The Chinese equivalent of the word credit encapsulates a host of lofty moral virtues as trustworthiness, promise keeping, norm abiding, integrity, and decency that apply to almost all contexts of social life and interactions. And so it would be appropriate. 
to refer to a system that is based on trustworthiness rather than creditworthiness. But is it really a system? Let's take a closer look at the project at its current stage. The social credit system consists of three interconnected elements. First, it's a national wide system of um, blacklists of individuals who have violated the law. And it's the Supreme People's Court of China was a pioneer and set up a first national, nationwide blacklist program for trust breaking enforcement subjects. From time to time, these individuals are subjected to general, general public shaming by having their names displayed on large land screens. The blacklisted individuals are included in the so called joint punishment system. According to the principle declared by Chinese leadership, once proven untrustworthy, restrictions should apply everywhere, which is connected with a number of harsh sanctions. A, center, uh, a certain uh, counterbalance to the blacklist are red lists, where individuals or other entities who are especially honest and trustworthy are, and deserve recognition are listed. Another element of the system are local social scoring systems, experimentally launched in selected cities and provinces. In general, over 40 such pilot projects have been started in China. The rules that have been adopted in those projects vary greatly and apply to different areas of citizens' lives. How it works? For instance, at the very start of the project, each citizen was awarded 1,000 points for actions assessed negatively, for example, breaking traffic rules or having children without necessary permission, points are counted off, while by performing actions assessed positively, such as caring for elderly family members, points are added and thus can be regained. The current score is presented on the scale from A to D, where having the high score, A, makes bureaucratic contacts between a citizen and the local government easier, while a low score can make it more difficult or even completely impossible, for instance, to apply for social benefits, various lessons or permissions. The last element of the social credit system are credit worthiness ratings created by Chinese financial institutions. For example, in public-private partnership, the Sizam credit system. Sizam credit system gives each user a score on the scale from 350 to 950 points based on five sets of information. And while the terms of the categories are publicly available, the specifics of how the algorithms operate and the very tools used in users' evaluations are not at all transparent. However, unquestionably, the consequences to individuals that come from either a high or low Sizam credit status are far reaching. As we can see, the social credit system is not a unified system. What is established today can be best described as so-called system of systems. At its current stage, the system has still a long way to go until it reaches the version of central control. But even though a unified system doesn't exist for now, its creation is surely possible or even certain, especially if we consider Chinese part party state's strategy. In January 2021, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China issued a new roadmap for the construction of rule of law society. It includes a declaration of ongoing development of the social credit system, and the main goal is the integration of the system. It's important to note that uh, the social credit system remains under party state control and the very functioning of the social credit system, especially at the level of the entire state, 
is associated with many, many quite obvious left. Abuse of the system for political purposes, censorship, a surveillance of the society, human rights violation, discrimination, and many more. After all, we are discussing a totalitarian state where mentioned threats and abuses have occurred and continue to occur in and without the social death system. However, my intention today is not to focus on the negative scenarios of how the social credit system is used by totalitarian government. I would rather like to analyze the social credit system in isolation from China's political situation and the rules that apply there. I would like to take a look at the social credit system from a more general perspective as a wide phenomenon. Let's now analyze the very idea of social credit system as a unified system based on trustworthiness. First, we must think what is the status of the rules of conduct verified by the system. To do this, I will use the famous in China sit occupier case, the case of Mr. Sun, who in high speed train occupied a seat by the window, which was not the seat he was assigned and didn't want to give the seat up to a passenger with a ticket for that seat. Even after the train services had interviewed, he still wouldn't leave a seat by the way. When analyzed in this case, we see on one hand that some legal provisions that govern rail traffic were violated, for which administrative fine was imposed. And on the other, Mr. Sun violated certain rules of behavior, rules of conduct commonly accepted by society in general, moral rules. That comes uh, that come was so that Mr. Sun was considered untrustworthy and was punished with a social credit system based sanction, being banned from boarding many types of train. Keeping this example in mind, Let's think about the relationship between social credit system and legal norms. Some say, especially those who are in favor of uh, social credit system, that um, the system is only support the enforcement of legal norms. However, I think this fails to exhaust the very essence of how the system operates. After all, it interferes with an area that has not been regulated at all until now. It's evaluated based on the trustworthiness criterion. And from this perspective, the boundary of understanding of a legal norm are extended. I suggest that trustworthiness as a social norm becomes a legal norm. But what trustworthiness actually is? Or rather, what is the nature of trust and trust? Worthiness. The most common, although questioned by some empirical studies, is the notion that trust is purely a cognitive category, a matter of nothing but knowledge. According to Russell Harding, who conceptualized the social phenomenon of trust in the framework of the theory of rational choice, trust is essentially a set of expectations that depend on rational assessments of the trustee's motivation. Trust is constructed as an encapsulated interest and can be analyzed in the following way. A trusts B to do X if A expects B to do X and A's expectation is grounded on A's rational assessment of B's motivations. Following this line of thinking, according to George Simon, we must recognize a very important element of trust, namely knowledge, or in fact, a certain lack of knowledge, information uncertainty. He points out that in order to talk about trust, a certain minimum degree of knowledge is necessary. Where then do we get this knowledge from? It can be provided in different ways. It can be derived from the experience we have gathered in past, real knowledge of the persons acquired through experience, or it can be common knowledge on a type or category of person, organization or institution. And so, trust is associated with uncertainty, with risk, when trusting without full knowledge, we read that the person we trust 
will fail us. This becomes a source of risk. Nicholas Hohmann put risk squarely at the heart of trust. He believed that trust is related to a twofold contingency. Contingency consists is in the exclusion of necessity and impossibility. There is contingency when there is a, there is a possibility of free choice and while it creates indeterminacy. And so trust is associated with reduction of complexity and more specifically of that complexity with which enters the world in consequence of the freedom of other human beings. In this sense, trust enables us to make a choice when the future is not, is uncertain. We should also consider one other aspect of trust, its moral dimension, commonly connected with motivation. It's yet another issue which we can tackle in numerous possible ways, among those discussed most frequently the motive of trustworthy people could be described in terms of moral commitment, moral obligation or virtue. Let's discuss one of the possibility. Moral obligation. First of all, first of all trust contains in, in itself a certain degree of acceptance of subordination, which may turn out to be unjustified if someone betrays your trust. It's connected to this mentioned previously. This can be described as follows. A trust B to do X. A's voluntary subordination places a constraint on B in relation to a social norm with the finality that go with it that demand that trust be honored. B feels obligated to continue a particular or general behavior that caused A to trust. Knowing that A trusts uh, B feels obligated to honor that trust. A can therefore count on the feeling of moral obligation that B will feel in order to estimate the probability of the behavior that A is expected of B. Please note that in case of trust, there is, a, emer there is emerged the reciprocity of engagements. Of course, uh, presented approaches are not unitedly accepted. We can discuss trust at the basis of for individual risk-taking behavior, the basis for cooperation or other or even uh, social capital. However, let's try to summarize what are the key elements of trust and trust workings. First, let's describe this as risk uncertainty and it has two aspects. One, on one hand, it's necessary to ensure that citizens have the possibility to free choice in this context, Simmel, uh, George Simmel uh, points out that trust is the result of the free choice of the individual who grants his or her trust and never as a duty. It cannot be delivered on demand. On the other, trust requires a certain level of knowledge, either based on experience or common knowledge. Second, trust comes with reciprocity of engagements. It involves not only the person who grants it, but also the one who benefits from it. In the context of reciprocity, it's worth highlighting some fundamental differences between the approach adopted in the social value system and that which is applied in European solutions. In the Polish legal system, we have important institutions that are associated with trust, such as vote of confidence of um, our profession of public trust, but even on a more fundamental level, the Polish constitution contained the principle of trust in the state and the law. The principle is derived from Article 2 of the Polish constitution, namely the concept of democratic state rule by law. This principle is rooted in an assumption that public authorities, government, should act with loyalty and fairness towards the individual, creating a sense of stability and legal security in the individuals and therefore a sense of confidence and trust. However, as we see, in comparison to the assumptions of the social care system, in the Polish case, it's the duty of public authorities, public institutions, to create the sense of trust, 
while in case of the social credit system, it's quite the opposite. It's not the state, government, not the system itself, which must be trustworthy, according to the citizens. It's the individuals and organization that must obtain and sustain a certain level of trustworthiness to prove their loyalty to the state. Finally, when thinking about and creating system that operates in analogy to the social credit system, we must be aware that in order for the system to fulfill its aims, to create a high trust society which rewards individuals and companies for following the law, it's not enough for trustworthiness to become a legal rule controlled and enforced by the citizens. First of all, it is crucial for the system itself to be trustworthy. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, finally, I was able to sit down. Just a moment. Okay, now I think I can speak freely without listening to me from different speakers. Uh, we had uh, wonderful three presentations uh, and now we have about 30 minutes to start a discussion before we will start the discussion i wanted to show you something as i promised before uh, because we are here located uh, in the senate room of uh, afm krakow in new york city as you can see it's not only me here but there are some more important here and those four gentlemen uh, on the wall in front of you are the founders of this uh, university. Uh, maybe we don't want to uh, talk much about them uh, right now. Uh, uh, we uh, had three speakers and we are waiting for uh, questions uh, from the audience. I, I already know that there are some questions from the audience that is located here. Uh, at the campus of the university. So uh, maybe we can start uh, with the questions from here. And if anybody from you uh, would like to ask a question, you can either post uh, uh, this question on the chat engine, or you can probably uh, ask uh, Talita to let you speak. And Talita is uh, our wonderful member of Iberojur who is the host of this meeting, I'm only a co-host. Okay, uh, as I've uh, learned, the first person to ask the question would be Dr. Iga Bawos from Andrzej Fritz Morzeski Krakow University. Mm -hmm. And she will use uh, uh, the place I used before. There we go. Okay, good afternoon, sirs. It's a little bit inconvenient since the person that I would like to ask the question sits, you know, just behind the computer. So um, uh, my name is Iga Baus. I'm assistant professor at Andrzej Fritz Mondrewski, uh, Krakow University. And I have a question to Professor Tsuru because um, I was wondering whether you, meant, whether you considered uh, the issue of public accessibility to that kind of AI aided tools. Uh, in the context of legislation, because I'm into that problem when it comes to the practices of IP offices. Here, the dimension is a little bit different because in IP offices, we have this uh, an equilibrium between applicants, which are from the business you know, environment and the obviously governmental side, which is represented by IP office. But here I was wondering, because um, there's a little bit um, similar path, because here we have uh, the citizens who may be interested in that kind of tools, especially when we take into consideration the civilian um, initiative, legislative initiative, because it's very uh, un unworded. Because you know, when you when you are in the government, when you have uh, legislative innovation, and you have all these uh, helps added by the government agencies, like the consultations, like checking whether it's in consistent with EU law, and when you are just a citizen, even though you have the right of uh, the legislative here you are just left alone. So I was thinking like whether you uh, consider the accessibility, public accessibility to this tool. And another thing that interests me 
is how it should be constructed, the software. Should it be like open source software? Because this is like, you know, one of the trends uh, when you go for the government because it's way cheaper than constructing everything from, uh, from the stretch. So these two issues, uh, which are, you know, the, the, the issues more open, uh, far reaching than the legal ones, like most social ones. So probably I should replace you right now here in front of the speaker. So I'll be listening to you from behind. Collect all the questions. Right. Yes, you wish. Okay. So, uh, okay, so I'm just yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, no, I, will, I will try to answer uh, to these questions. They are both very important, actually. Obviously, I will start for the second question because it's much easier to answer it uh, simply because uh, there are two philosophies about the constructing the systems, public system, electronic public system depending on what type of function it has to play. Of course, if you have an open, uh, open uh, access uh, uh, solutions, they are uh, in the long term much more secure, in fact, but they are not controlled by the state. So this, this, is, this is the problem that, in fact, they are maybe uh, more safe and they are more transparent and they involve more participation from the society, uh, engineers and in general, but it, it results in the lack of control by the centralized state. So there is question, what is the policy be behind? Um, but as I said during my presentation, the, 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 what we uh, suggest to the government is rather to keep open sources uh, solution than to make a centralized uh, a centralized tools uh, especially because of the cost of development in, in the end uh, it is much more difficult to create a fully secure uh, uh, solutions uh, when they are uh, not making an open uh, sources version so this would be my answer to the first question while the question of uh, public accessibility of, of, of the tools, well, that depends whether we are talking about uh, legislative aided or machine consumable legislation. Because this is actually, in fact, a crucial difference. Because uh, if a certain uh, IT tool uh, is just helping you uh, in certain actions, so it's, it's just a sub support, but it doesn't have any legal, uh, um, it, it doesn't create, it doesn't uh, issue any legal bounding decision. Uh, then the problem of the transparency or the problem of accessibility of the code is not so much important because in the end, what matters is legal text and legal norms. And if the, if the machine doesn't work properly or anything, you always can, uh, go to the court and to say, well, it is not according uh, to certain rules or the, the, the software doesn't, doesn't function uh, properly, and it, if it is public, of course, software, yes. But with the computer machine consumable legislation, situation is very different. Because here, it is uh, the system that controls decision-making problem, actually. It's the, the, the rules of law are introduced into the cyberspace, into the architecture of the system. Actually, the system is working according to law. This is the idea behind. So the question is, if you have two versions, the paper version of the law and the system that is made by the state and is a kind of implementation, automatic implementation of the rule, then the problem is, which version is the, 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 the source of law? If there is any discrepancy in the in the written version and in the technical version, on this uh, computer version, uh, and of course in here you have to have access to uh, to the codes because you have to understand where the the difference of uh, the different um, the difference in the functioning of the system results from the mistakes in the code, or it just a uh, different type of interpretation of the same uh, provision or the same uh, norm. If it's a question just of interpretation, well, we can interpret the situation as a kind of legal interpretation. This is the code is the legal interpretation of the, of the particular, uh, uh, of the particular uh, norm or rule. While 
if it's a mistake in the code, then obviously we have to uh, change the code and we have to uh, we have to improve the the algorithm that governs the whole decision making uh, process. And without the easy access to to codes, uh, without the transparency, without uh, without um, possibility to to explain uh, carefully and and uh, in details why certain decisions were made by the system, you you will have no control over it. And uh, that is the, one of the most important things. Actually, I think uh, later speakers who will be talking about artificial intelligence and, and law, they will see, they will explain and say something more about it because there are different types of systems. Some of them allows you to explain why decision was made by the system and some others are not, well, it's not, not so easy to see why system gives certain system uh, um, results in certain decisions. So, so uh, I believe that um, this is a crucial issue well, first, the crucial issue probably is not to make this kind of systems. I, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, and I will not, I would dare to support this kind of solutions because I see too many threats, not only for citizens and for, but for the whole culture of law we are, uh, we are uh, leading it, especially that we believe that the law is a normative phenomenon, and here we don't have anymore any normativity in that, in that classical uh, sense. It's just um, cybernetics. It means controlling uh, and and uh, supervising and forcing people to to act in a particular way without any choice. So it's not that you should do, and if you don't, uh, we will eventually punish you if we catch you. But you have no other alternative but to do it according to the rules of the algorithm of the system. So I believe if we decide to create this kind of systems, we have to be very cautious about. Uh, the quality of the standards, the transparency of, of the standards. Uh, uh, it has to be, as I said, uh, the standards have to be uh, understandable, has to be um, adjustable for future needs. And uh, my, uh, 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 my experience is that the, all these things, they sound nice, but in practice, it, it's very difficult to uh, to achieve uh, those aims. Yeah, but I was thinking also about another issue. Like, do you think that there's any justification to treat it as a product that the citizens should have access to? Not even the code, but the fact that we have the government. Ah, oh, all right. Certain products, and now you have the website. You can upload. Oh, okay. You know the the team of, of the legislative act which you are trying to create, and now you're entitled to use the same commodity as we do as the government. Okay. Well, that's a, diff a bit different issue. But as long as the uh, algorithm uh, is not uh, validating your actions, but just supporting your actions, yes, I would I agree that citizens and governments should have access to the same tools uh, because it creates a kind of equilibrium. Uh, but it is a completely different situation where, when the government is creating uh, machine consumable legislation, because then obviously uh, there is an interest uh, in, in the government uh, to control uh, these kinds of systems, uh, because this is the way how you execute the law actually. And uh, well, now it, and from this perspective, it become very much a political issue and not technical anymore. How much you would like to share with the society because it's obviously uh, the more you share, well, the more people will know how it functions and you will find more people willing to, uh, well, sp some specialists, obviously, not uh, uh, lay persons, who will try to uh, avoid it, yes, to hack it, to avoid it. And a lot of new threats are, are, are appear on screen, which maybe never uh, pops up when, when things are centralized and not accessed. Uh, accessible for for uh, for the uh, general public. Okay, as as you can see, since we are in Poland and in Krakow, Polish law professors ask questions themselves, and they cannot ever agree on anything. 
uh, this is usual. I have moved to a different uh, room. Uh, and uh, I have noticed that there is an interesting question to Professor Wilson Engelman asked by, um, uh, let me check, Horacio Montescio. And the question is uh, about uh, the introduction of artificial intelligence into the judiciary. So Professor Engelman, can you ask this question? And there is another question to you from uh, Professor Piotr Stets from uh, Opole University. And uh, it's also on the chat. He asked if there are any alternatives to the artificial intelligence, something like parallel paths of development, et cetera. Uh, you can check it on chat if you want. Please uh, okay. ask those questions. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. I will ask the, I will ask the, the first question on uh, Portuguese. And the second, I will try to uh, ask in English. Uh, muito obrigado, Horácio, uh, pela sua pergunta. E, e é uma pergunta extremamente importante, uma pergunta que atualmente uh, se está fazendo uh, no Brasil e também fora daqui, que é a questão da implementação da inteligência artificial junto ao Poder Judiciário. Uh, Existem várias abordagens, mas uma delas que me parece é, é, bastante desafiadora é acreditar que com a inteligência artificial se terá uma redução do número de processos. Tá? Eu, eu sou cético em relação a isso e, e penso que é, a inteligência artificial não tem esse poder, né? porque a inteligência artificial continua sendo um meio e não um fim, né? Então, eh, provavelmente, a redução do número de processos dependerá de reformas estruturais mais profundas nos códigos de processo, né? seja no Código de Processo Civil, no Código de Processo Penal, além dos outros códigos de processo. Entretanto, eh, provavelmente haverá impacto eh, na medida em que eh, o Poder Judiciário poderá eh, agilizar determinadas etapas né, e poderá efetivamente ter uma resposta jurisdicional mais adequada é, em termos de, de é, atos processuais é, intermediários. A minha grande questão, e eu acho que a discussão do, do colega que me antecedeu na resposta vai nessa direção, é, a grande questão que se coloca e que nós do direito precisamos debater é a partir do momento em que a inteligência artificial for utilizada para a tomada de decisões. Tá? Então, eu penso que eh, esse efetivamente é um momento crucial, não é? porque nós já temos vários exemplos, eh, não no Brasil, mas fora do Brasil, em que o sistema quando ele tomou determinadas decisões, ele eh, exteriorizou determinados vieses. Né? Então, eu penso que essa é uma questão muito importante, porque atualmente ainda o sistema ele depende eh, de que humanos levem dados para dentro do sistema. E, e, e nesse ato de levar eh, dados, eh, efetivamente poderão ser levados traços, poderão ser levados inclinações pessoais e, por que não dizer, até ideologias, que efetivamente o sistema vai reproduzir, porque o sistema, aparentemente, ele não tem um filtro para avaliar, por exemplo, eh, eh, determinados eh, vieses aceitáveis, de outros não, vieses legais, de outros vieses ilegais, né? então se tem essa, essa possibilidade de divisão, mas, de qualquer modo, eh, Horácio, eu penso que nós temos aí uma situação bastante complexa e que nós precisamos avaliar com muita seriedade. Né? E, e o próprio CNJ, quando eh, edita a resolução 332, eh, enumera uma série de princípios eh, que dialogam também com os princípios que estão no projeto de lei 5051, ou sim, agora deixa eu só conferir aqui o, no, o número, é 5051, existe um projeto de lei em tramitação desde 2019, e curiosamente esse projeto também, ele é, pretende regular por meio de princípios, que parece uma coisa meio meio fora do propósito de uma análise mais rigorosa, porque os princípios têm um poder normativo, 
uh, que não precisam uh, de uma lei. Então, eu penso que ainda tem, tem muita coisa para ser esclarecida, mas eu chamaria a atenção para dois princípios, um deles que é o princípio da transparência e o princípio da auditabilidade de como o sistema funciona. Penso que esses são dois uh, aspectos muito importantes. Tá? Não sei se eu respondi. Uh... Uh, professor, uh, I, I can see the question uh, that. Uh... Mm -hmm. Yes, the question. The question was uh, uh, whether there are any alternatives to artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, I think uh, the uh, artificial intelligence is a big challenge uh, for us, and. Uh, I think I say to, to, to the, the Horacio that I uh, answered the, the, the first question. I think uh, an important question uh, concerns uh, about the transparency and the auditability of the way that artificial intelligence and the algorithms works. I think uh, here we have uh, two concerns uh, and uh, I'm not sure uh, that uh, we are uh, enough uh, rules or enough uh, principles to guide uh, to this way that the artificial intelligence uh, can give us uh, the enough transparency uh, the way that uh, he work. I'm not sure too Uh, that we have an alternative of artificial intelligence. Uh, I think for, for uh, the humans, for our all, uh, the alternative uh, is to study uh, the, emotional, the emotional intelligence. Uh, I think uh, this is a human characteristic, and I think this characteristic is the way uh, that the human can survive in the artificial intelligence era. I think this is, for me, the, the, the best way uh, to study and I think the best way to prepare uh, the future lawyers or other uh, uh, juridical professor, professionals uh, that deal with the uh, Uh, human emotions uh, for survive that the uh, artificial intelligence emotions. I think this is in this moment my my answer. Thank you, Professor, very much. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is a very interesting issue, and we can probably discuss it for the next few hours. But yes. <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have a time, and we do have uh, more questions coming. Uh, I don't think that uh, there will be possible to answer them all, but right now I know that there is a question from uh, the room here to Professor Julia Stanek, and I think that uh, Dr. Alexandra Partik wants to ask something, so please, floor is yours. I think it would be the best if you can come over here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, uh, thank you very much, Professor Julia Stanek, for the excellent uh, speech. Uh, it's really inspiring. And I'd like to address two questions for you. Uh, first of all, do you think that one day in Poland we'll have also such a question, uh, such a system here? And if so, would it be more scaring or lovely, in your opinion? And the second thing, um, I'm a civilist and I'm Uh, very much uh, interested in Article 5 of Polish Civil Code, uh, which is connected with the principles of social coexistence. How far is it from the transportiness and can we compare it? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And I hope Professor Stanek is with us and maybe she can answer the questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can and I will. <laughs> uh, I will start with the second question because it's uh, shorter. 
so first I should highlight that uh, trustworthiness, I understand trustworthiness as a social norm, uh, though very important, but still social norm. And um, the principles, in, and from this perspective, the principles of um, of um, community co coexistence is a wider concept. And I think that these principles of uh, um, community coexistence includes, uh, include uh, this trustworthiness. Um, for instance, uh, when in, th in some cases, uh, the court uh, judges uh, assess, um, assess who betrays Trust, uh, trust, who, in what circumstance, circumstance the trust was betrayed, and uh, who was um, trustworthy in this situation. So I think that um, that uh, it's uh, it's one of the part of uh, um, principle uh, of these principles you mentioned. Uh, and um, the uh, first question is is harder. Um, I think that. Uh, such um, such system that is uh, tested now in currently in China is um, will be developed will be created in uh, in other countries and I think that um, I think it's um, unavoidable because uh, it's too um, too temptate too big temp too strong temptation to use such a system when um, it's available when it's uh, effective. And uh, I think that it's a matter of time when we uh, start to develop something like uh, that uh, system. Um, and I think that crucial questions, um, uh, crucial, crucial question there is uh, what, on what fundamental principle uh, we will base uh, on that system. And um, I have you, you ask was it what it will be scary or um, hopeful and I think uh, that hopefully in the European Union we are heading in a good direction and I think that we are choosing uh, some principles now is choosing some principles and one of the principles is trustworthy and uh, even um, even relevant uh, recently, the European Committee released uh, some proposal of uh, artificial intelligence systems uh, uh, to, um, to, to evaluate the risk connected with uh, this system. And um, um, in this, um, in this um, uh, document, in this proposal, uh, assess uh, some, some risk, um, risk uh, system of uh, evaluating the risk of uh, I, um, Artificial intelligence, um, uh, artificial intelligence system, and uh, I, 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 I think that we will hear today something uh, more about this uh, this proposal by um, the European Committee. And I, um, in this in this proposal, I um, there is um, some uh, kind of regulations that connected of uh, a system of scoring scoring uh, scoring systems. So I think that. Uh, it's unavoidable, and uh, we uh, we should prepare uh, to such uh, systems. And I think that uh, I hope it will be uh, not uh, not uh, functioning that uh, the same way as uh, in that China. In China, thank you. Well, thank you. This is a very fascinating issue. I think we have uh, about three minutes left. There are plenty of questions uh, on the chat, but I think one of these questions is really important. And I would like to ask uh, uh, on the name of uh, one of the participants to Professor Engelmann, uh, and maybe it will be possible that you can answer this question maybe in uh, English. It is something about cyber attacks uh, uh, for the judiciary in Brazil, uh, this question is on chat. So yes, yes, uh, I think uh, the 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 cyber security. I I, I read a, a part of my my uh, my answer in the in the chat, but I think the cyber security is an important issue uh, for the use of artificial intelligence and the uh, judiciary power, especially here in Brazil. Uh, we have uh, uh, an uh, attack to to the uh, uh, 
tribunal of the, 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 the judiciary, judiciary uh, of the state of Rio Grande do Sul, and we have a lot of troubles with them. And I think uh, uh, we must, uh, I think that the, 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 the trustworthiness that Professor Julia asked to, to us is uh, the principal key to, uh, uh, to trust on the artificial intelligence uh, application in everywhere, but especially in, in the judiciary power. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And okay. uh, I uh, am uh, really sorry that we are out of time, uh, but I'm pretty sure that a uh, few more uh, interesting presentations are in front of us. And in about one minute, we shall divide into three panels. Uh, panel one, uh, hosted by Professor Maria uh, de Rosario Anos, uh, will be uh, in the room A uh, on the subject of judiciary and smart justice. Uh, room B, hosted by uh, Professor Piotr Stets, uh, is uh, on the subject of legal tech and law tech, whatever that means. Uh, and uh, Room C, hosted by dear friend of mine, Professor João Prensia Xaver uh, from Quimbra, will be uh, divided uh, uh, into the uh, discussion on human rights and digital society. So I, I encourage all of you uh, to choose the right panel and uh, let that discussion begin. Thank you very much. Uh, for joining us and I'm really happy that uh, this uh, is uh, something that is interesting also to me and I hope it is interesting uh, to all of you. Uh, we'll see each other later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the attention. I hope see you soon personality in Poland. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.